Uh, we are on chapter 14 in the book of Acts, uh, and uh, where we've been coming from, we're on Paul's first missionary journey, so the map's back up for you. Those watching online, it'll be superimposed on the frame again. Um, and uh, we, we are just at the point where we're seeing the constant give and take. Usually he's going to the Jewish synagogue, that's his start point, and there are people who are brought into the family of faith, uh, who hear the word and it takes root and grows, and then there's always those who are opposing it and pushing back. Uh, but in the face of all that, a couple of really important consistent themes come out. Uh, one of them, for instance, is in chapter 13, uh, verse uh, 46 and following. You know, Paul and Barnabas are answering those who are jealous about the success of the Christian message. And the answer say, you know, we, we took the word of God to you. Uh, we took it to the family of faith first, but you reject it, uh, so now we turn to the Gentiles. And by the way, it's no surprise that that should take place. He quotes there, for instance, from the prophet Isaiah talking about being a light to the Gentiles. And that's not an isolated kind of a statement in the Old Testament in the prophets. Uh, it comes out over and over again, and we'll see it in the sections we read today. Uh, the Gentiles are filled with joy, and then there's further pushback at the end of chapter 13 about people who are trying to stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas leave, and they go to Iconium. That's where we pick up today, uh, and uh, shake the dust off their feet, kind of a cultural sign that says, We've had it with this, we're moving on. Uh, and uh, the disciples, the concluding statement in 13, were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And that's the other important recurring theme. Uh, the pushback is not going to win. The Lord God will win. The disciples are filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So we pick up at Iconium in chapter 14 today, uh, and let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you. Your mercy is new each and every morning. We pray today that you would be at work in us, creating fertile soil for your Holy Spirit, for the planting of the seed of the word, for its roots to deepen and become stronger and grow, that we would better reflect who you are in this world. We pray all of this with confidence, for you are faithful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're at Iconium chapter 14, verse 1. There it reads, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, that's their pattern, to the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively or in such a way that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Uh, the more literal is to say they spoke in such a way. And I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but when I read they spoke so effectively, uh, as a pastor, you know what that makes me think? How come I don't speak that effectively? And as a Christian, what does it make you think? I can't speak that effectively. And the literal translation is they spoke in such a way. And that to me puts it in a better setting because who's really driving everything that's happening? God the Holy Spirit. And so they spoke in such a way that they didn't get in the way of the Holy Spirit, I think is a better way of understanding that. And that should be our prayer as we give witness to our faith day by day as well. So they spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. So that's good. That's the goal. Uh, the Gentiles should be included. But the opposition is there immediately. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they're trying to create division and disunity. And that's one of Satan's favorite tactics to create division and disunity, to try and, and sort of get a wedge driven in when the word of God is being shared. Now, it's interesting how they're described in verse 2. It's the Jews who refused to believe. Active participle, they are making a decision. They are making a choice. Uh, and it reminds me of what we read, for instance, in 2 Peter 3, uh, in the last days scoffers will come. Uh, and they will willfully forget everything that God has done in the history of this world, speaking specifically to the flood and all its effects and impacts, but in general as well. They willfully choose to forget. Uh, and you know, when I look at the world around me, I, I think a person would have to willfully choose not to believe that there is a creator. Uh, take something as simple, for instance, as a, uh, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Now you tell me, how it is possible by a series of incremental tiny steps 
that a caterpillar makes a cocoon, turns to liquid inside that cocoon, and emerges on the other end as a butterfly. That can't happen with a series of tiny steps. That's got to be one designed process right from the start. Uh, and, and that's uh, what we see all around us in creation. You know, the more we learn about how the universe and how life and how we are put together, the more it becomes apparent that everything had to be created in one specific, completed, designed unit. Uh, there were no incremental steps. Anyhow, so that's another example of what we see today. People, I think, refuse to believe. Why? Because if I believe there is a God, that has implications. That has a ripple effect in my life. I have to stand before God. I'm responsible to God. And I only want to be responsible to me. Okay? Uh, I think that's what's really going on in people's hearts. At any rate, in this case, they tried to create division by, by poisoning the minds of both Jew and Gentile against uh, uh, the message of the gospel. So what happened? Verse uh, 3, so because that was happening, Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs, signposts that give direction, and wonders or marvels. So God backed them up. And when you and I take a step of faith, God is there. When we take the next step of faith, God is there. Uh, and you might be hearing that and thinking, yeah, I don't know if that's been my experience. It doesn't mean it won't be hard. Uh, Jesus said it is through many types of trouble that you will enter the kingdom of God. Uh, it's not easy, but take the step of faith, not because of you, but because of who God is, because he is powerful. And we have another example here of him doing what he always does, working out his plan in the history of the world. Verse 4 Still, the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. And that's the first use of the word apostle. Okay? An apostle is an ambassador, uh, a messenger. And, and this is the first time they're described that way. And I think it's kind of fitting that it comes in this first missionary journey uh, where they are literally mes messengers sent by the, the home church. Uh, this is, in this case, back in Antioch in Syria, uh, and, and they have been commissioned and sent out uh, as ambassadors for the gospel. So they will be called apostles very frequently from this point forward. Uh, there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them, Paul and Barnabas, and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Is anything stopping the preaching? No. Is anything stopping the good news? No. So you can see they headed a little bit more to uh, the south and to the east, Lystra and Derbe. And Derbe was kind of the turnaround point of the first missionary journey. That's why the arrows go in both directions. They're going to retrace their steps uh, as we proceed on. But nothing is stopping the gospel. Now, were they wrong to flee? No, Jesus himself said there will be times, Matthew chapter 10, he said there will be times where you are persecuted for the gospel, flee to another place. You know, there's times to stand. They spoke boldly earlier. There's times to flee. Uh, and how do you know which time it is? Well, the Spirit guides, the Spirit leads, uh, and that's what was happening in this particular instance too. And by the way, it's never a situation of, oh, if I do the wrong thing, everything is lost. If your heart is seeking to serve the Lord God, if that is your motive, then God is going to work with the decisions. He's going to work with the choices. He's going to work everything together for the good of those who love him. Um, so there, there shouldn't be fear tied into that by any means. All right, so now we're in Lystra and Derbe. Starts out in verse, uh, I guess that's verse 8 in Lystra. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. Okay, you can probably guess what's going to happen. He's going to be healed. Spoiler alert, it's going to happen. Remember, there were all kinds of other people afflicted with all kinds of other things that were not miraculously healed. So when one is cherry-picked out and placed into the text of Scripture, there's a reason for it. And you know, I think there's a very good reason why this encounter in Lystra uh, is recorded for us in the book of Acts. We'll explain that as we go through. First of all, in verse 9, the man, the crippled man, listened. And the idea behind the word is he's, he's listening intently and just taking it all in. It's not a casual thing, okay? He, he listened to Paul as he was speaking. 
Paul looked directly at him. That was culturally not done. This is someone who would be below you culturally. You would never look them in the eye. But we've seen it before where the apostles did this and they're doing it again. This is eye contact. I'm speaking to you directly. He looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. Now, this is not saying that it was the strength of the man's faith that healed him. You know, got to look at the grammar here again. Uh, he saw uh, that this man uh, had uh, he, faith to be healed, uh, to save, literally. Uh, and where had that faith come from? Well, he had listened intently, verse 9, to Paul. And the Holy Spirit was at work. And the Holy Spirit planted the seed of faith in the man's heart. And it, the man was not standing in the way of the Holy Spirit's work. He was receiving it with gladness. So he had faith to save. Uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, Paul took this action. And I think there's a very uh, clear reason why this man was singled out uh, to be miraculously healed. It's a sign for the people in that community. And they're going to react in a way that we haven't seen before but it's something that is going to be an important element in, in uh, witnessing for the sake of the gospel outside of the Jewish community. The, the witnesses are going to experience this kind of reaction more and more, and so we're being introduced to it here. So uh, Paul said, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. You know, I'm at the point in life where when I get up out of a chair, I might walk a little funny the first couple of steps. This man just, who had never walked, he leapt up. This is miraculous. It would be astonishing for people to see. And when the crowd, here's the reaction that we haven't seen before. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian, Lods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. So in, in their, uh, their pantheon of gods, Hermes was the communicator, the messenger, and Zeus was kind of the head. But as it says, because Paul was the one doing most of the talking, they called him Hermes, the, the speaker or the communicator. Now, we haven't seen that before. We've seen people say, blasphemy. How can they do that? We've seen people react indifferently, but we have never seen them call out that Paul or whoever was speaking is one of their gods. We haven't seen that yet. Um, so, and, and, and again, this is going to be something they encounter more and more leading up to Act 17 in Athens where, where there's a real paradigm shift in how the gospel is presented. Paul meets the Athenians right where they are at. He doesn't try and make little Jewish background people out of them. He meets them where they are at and shows God's presence in their lives from that point, uh, which is what's going to happen here in a way as well. All right, so verse 15, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. Uh, so the reaction is strong, and you can understand why it needed to be strong and visible. You know, this is not appropriate in any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we are bringing you good news, it goes on to say, telling you to turn from these lifeless, these, these vessels that are void of any hope, these worthless things, the NIV puts it, to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. So it goes right to God's creative power and ability. Um, Turn away from these things that are worthless and lifeless to the one who put everything together. Uh, and, uh, you know, Romans chapter 1, who God is is apparent as people look at the world around them, and the Bible says they are without excuse. Uh, it, it is so frustrating to see how people will twist and turn and try to come up with new theories that fill the gaps in their theories that don't work about how everything came out of nothing and evolved over billions of years and all the evidence keeps stacking up against it so they have to change what they think and believe and twist it up even more and make it more complex and make up things that must be out there that nobody's ever seen. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, anybody ever seen a comet? I've never seen one. But uh, comets, they're basically chunks of like frozen material and debris. 
And as they go in their elliptical arcs around the sun, when they get too close to the sun, they start to melt. Some of the frozen material starts to melt, and that's what gives the comet its tail. So the comet's getting smaller and smaller and smaller over time. If the universe is billions of years old, there shouldn't be any anymore. They should all have melted and burned up and be gone. And yet there are many, many, many that are out there in a very regular orbit. So you know what the solution to that is? There's something out there called an Oort cloud, O-O-R-T. And it's mysterious, and no one's ever seen it, and we can't put a finger on where it might be or what might be causing it, but it's making comets out there. That's the science, oh, hang on, let me put that in air quotes. That's the scientific explanation. That's sad. People refuse to believe. Romans 1, the evidence is there in view of all that God has created. So Paul starts out with that. He's the one who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Uh, verse 16, in the past, he let all nations go their own way yet. He has not left himself without testimony. Creation is one. And he has also, it goes on to say, shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Does it sound like Paul is saying, this God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in it is good? It does, doesn't it? He provides for you and he fills your hearts with joy. That's a stark contrast to Zeus and Hermes, who were gods you had to manipulate. Gods you had to kind of you know, butter up to get good things from. You couldn't trust them. And, and so there's a real, uh, there's a point of contact. There is a God. He's the one who made everything. You believe that there's gods who made things. Okay, let me tell you about them. But there's also pointing out how the true God is so different from what humans expect. He is good. He is kind. He is faithful. But even 18, even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. You know, they were so entrenched in, in, in um, having to uh, placate their gods that, that they were afraid not to. Uh, they, they might miss the boat, and, and then Zeus might be mad at them. So, you know, it seems like it fell largely on deaf ears, but the Holy Spirit was at work there as well. Uh, and, and some were brought into the kingdom. But other opposition keeps stacking up. Verse 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Now, if you look at the map again, okay, we're down in Lystra. Iconium is a little ways. Antioch is quite a ways. They came all the way to harass Paul and Barnabas. They had to be really angry to do that, didn't they? Uh, they came all the way and, uh, and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. Why did God allow that stoning to happen? I think he was showing again that there is no way you defeat or thwart the plans of the living God. You can try to do what you will as human beings. God is bigger and he is greater. And notice it kind of builds on that message that he cares for you, he sends the rain, and, and he fills your heart with joy. It builds on that message that God is good by not striking them down like Zeus probably would have for uh, stoning a man who was clearly a messenger of God because of his miraculous recovery. You know, to be stoned to the point where they thought you were dead, you don't just get up and walk back into town. That doesn't happen. So when they saw Paul coming, I think the first thing that would happen was fear struck into their hearts. But then they aren't struck down. You know, if he's Zeus he's, or Hermes, he's not doing anything against us. What did he say about God again? He's good. And God is opening the door for the message. He's preparing the way for the message. And it seems to me that's why this particular uh, scene in Lystra is included here. You know, sometimes we'll just see, and as they went along, they preached the gospel in all the towns, and we don't get any detail. Well, here we get detail, and I think it's because there's this shift. They're shifting into the Gentile world, but where did they first speak the gospel to the Gentiles? It was the proselytes that were at the synagogue. Now they're out in the marketplace. Now they're out there talking to people who know nothing about the God of the Old Testament. And, and a different approach is being used. An approach that goes back to who God is and how he's much bigger and greater and better than anything that you have imagined. All right, 
So now we are going back to uh, Antioch in Syria in verse 21. Um, they preached, uh, sorry, yes, they preached the good news in that city, uh, so uh, Derbe, where they left off in verse 20, and won a large number of disciples. Nothing is defeating the gospel. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, the ones they had preached to previously on the way in, they're on the way out now, and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Notice how they encouraged them. You know, uh, does this sound like encouragement? We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Well, that is encouragement when you're telling people the truth and reality. This is what you can expect. Uh, Jesus said, your cross comes before your crown. Um, and, and, and it's also good news because this being true, we must go through many hardships. Notice, not around, not under, not avoid them. We go through them uh, to enter the kingdom of God. So if you're facing hardship, that's a sign you're entering the kingdom. If you're facing hardship for the sake of witnessing to Jesus about who he is, face hardship for that, that's a good sign that you are entering the kingdom of God. Why? Because where is Satan going to push back? He's going to push back among the believers. He's going to try and harm them and discourage them. The rest of the world out there, he's got in his back pocket already. He's not dealing with them too much. But he's going to be on the attack where the gospel is being spoken. Jesus warned us about that. Uh, and the apostles are just reinforcing that here. So it is an encouragement to say, oh yeah, this is reality. When you see these things happening, lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing near. Uh, 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. The idea is that they are selected and they are selected certainly prayerfully on the basis of their, their spiritual maturity. Uh, Paul and Barnabas can't be there forever, so these will be people who will keep the local group centered on the gospel and from drifting to left or right. Uh, and these people then are given over, committed to the Lord uh, in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, so we're heading closer to the, uh, the Mediterranean again. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Now, you might remember when they first came and landed at uh, Perga and the Italia area, they didn't stay there very long uh, because of uh, Paul's illness. So it seems like on the way back, they're spending a little bit more time there than they had in the other places uh, to build up the community of believers there. All right, so now we're starting to see bits of organization in the local congregations. Uh, people are being set apart as elders to, to keep people on, on track. And we're going to see um, even more organization in the church at large as we move uh, into chapter 15 in just a minute or two. So 26 from Italia, they sailed back to Antioch. So that's Syrian Antioch now, where they had been committed, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. And again, it's, it's a, a, a beautiful example uh, of how God intended the church to work. The church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas out. They committed them for that task. Paul and Barnabas, therefore, were not just going on their own. Hey, I'm Paul. Hey, I'm Barnabas. Listen to me. This is the community of faith that is sending them with that mission. And so Paul and Barnabas have backing. They have someone behind them. Today, when a congregation calls a pastor and, and sets that person apart, uh, and they are behind that person too, and it's, it's a hand-in-glove kind of a relationship. And then and upon returning, uh, verse 27, the appropriate thing is that Paul and Barnabas gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. God had done. It's never credit taken by Paul and Barnabas or anyone else. Look at what God has done. They had been entrusted to God when they were committed and sent out. Now we're reporting back what God has done. God is good. God is powerful. And if you think of the things that they were able to report, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? That they were able to report that those kinds of things happened that did take place. Miraculous things. And God had, in the face of all opposition, seen to it that what happened? 
Believers kept being brought into the fold. Uh, and so it ends up in the chapter 14 by saying, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples uh, in Antioch. Probably close to a year. Uh, and what would have been happening during that period of time? There's more teaching. There are people, others being sent out that we're not even told about. Uh, the church is doing what the church does. It is going into all the world witnessing for the sake of the gospel. So good things are happening. What needs to happen, or what's bound to happen then? It doesn't need to, but it's bound to. Push back, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, I've said many times in my ministry over the years, when everything seems too peaceful and quiet, that's when I worry the most. You know, at least when things are cropping up here and there, as much as I don't enjoy that, at least you know where the devil's at work, right? Uh, it's, it's when he's laying low and you're kind of thinking, okay, where's he going to pop his head up next? Those are the times that bother me the most. So they've got a problem here in chapter 15, and it's going to be identified and it's going to be dealt with clearly. Now, anytime you make a choice that moves your life in a new direction, there are probably going to be ripple effects, you know, secondary issues that arise out of that choice that you kind of look at later and go, oh, tch, didn't think about that. And it's part of human nature that we don't see everything clearly all the time. The Gentiles are brought into the church, but what about all of our heart language Old Testament traditions? Don't they have to obey them too? And that's the question that's arising here. Um, now, big picture response to that, Paul writes, for instance, in Galatians 5, okay, you want to trust in the law for your salvation? Then obey how much of it? All of it. You know, if you're going to put your foot into that direction, you better do it perfectly and handle and obey all of it perfectly. Whoever breaks the law at just one point stumbles, breaks all of it, um, you know, says the book of James. So it can never be Jesus and that saves me. It's Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Now, are we to bear fruit? Of course we are. But that's not how we are saved. That is a result of being saved. And what's happening in chapter 15 is some people probably with good intentions, others with less than honorable intentions, are trying to lay some law onto the Gentile believers. Okay, chapter 15, some men came down from Judea to Antioch. And again, when you leave the area around Jerusalem, you always go down. Okay, so they come down to Antioch, which is up north from them. And we're teaching the brothers, the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And it's going to go even farther in a few minutes' time. Uh, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, assigned. Again, they never do it because they're so important. They never do it because I'm Paul and I'm Barnabas and we're the leaders. They do it because they are assigned by the church. Uh, they were signed along with some of the other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. All right, a couple of important things happen here. The one I've mentioned already, they don't do it of their own volition. They are commissioned or assigned or set apart by the church. And what are they going to do? They're going to go to the home base. They're going to go and ask the apostles for an opinion on this uh, and the leaders of the church, the home church in Jerusalem. So what's the goal? The goal is unity. We all want to be on the same page in this. And we have a question, so we want to talk about the question with you. Nobody is flying off, you know, just doing things off the cuff. Uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in that. There's a lot of wisdom in discussing things with the Christian community because that then leads to unity. And that was their goal here. So they went to the apostles and elders with the question. Uh, the church sent them on their way. And it's very deliberate again, right? They were sent. They didn't go on their own. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Same emphasis. Everything God had done through them. Now, Important things here. Back in verse 3, as they were going through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. Notice the fact that the Gentiles are brought into the family of faith isn't the issue for them. 
They're glad that the Gentiles have been converted. They're glad that they have been brought into the family of faith. That is not at issue right from the very get-go. What is at issue is the peripheral things, you know, the, the things that spoke to the language of their heart, okay? Um, it goes on to say, then some of the believers, so they're believers, who belong to the party of the Pharisees. Now, doesn't that seem like a contradiction to you? It kind of does to me. They're believers, but they're part of a party, a group that is so wrapped up in the law that they added hundreds of laws that weren't in the Bible to what is in the Bible. It seems to me like that's trying to mix oil and water. But you see, they're human. They had a language that spoke to their heart. And it was the language of those laws. And that's why I say some of them, at least, were very genuine in their concern, I think. They really wanted to honor God. And you know, all these things that were so important for generations and generations, you're telling us they don't matter anymore? Well, yeah, they don't, because they all pointed to Christ and they've been fulfilled in Christ. But moving from that, uh, sorry, moving from a point of, of being so rooted in those traditions to seeing that, yeah, they really don't matter anymore, that's a process for a human being, isn't it? Um, and we go through similar processes. Uh, you know, one of the ones that I always mention, because this has been a part of my ministry for, you know what, even before I was in ministry, since I was old enough to remember, a teenager at least, in Christian circles in North America, worship style, right? What kind of music can you use? What kind of instruments can you use? And, you know, it's not something where people's opinions are changed overnight. And, and thanks be to God, he works on people's hearts and helps them to see that, okay, there's a difference between what's biblical and, and what I prefer. And yeah, so for the sake of others who who are fed better in different means, okay, I can do that. And the other group needs to be doing the same thing. And, and it's a beautiful thing when unity is sought that way. Uh, but it doesn't happen overnight, does it? And so for these believers, it didn't happen overnight either. Now, that's putting the best construction on it. But I can also safely say that there were some who weren't there with a genuine faith because Paul reports in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, that some came to spy on the freedom we have in Christ. So they were there with an agenda. Uh, and their agenda was the same as it always was for that group to get rid of uh, the message of, the, of salvation through Jesus. So probably some of both included in what we're reading about here today. But uh, they uh, stood up and said in verse 5, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So now it's moved beyond circumcision to all of it. Okay, slippery slope when the door is opened for many things, right? You open it a crack and it gets pushed open a mile. Um, and, and that seems to be what was happening here too. And that probably was driven by the ones who were there with bad intent. They saw an opportunity. They can't have that kind of freedom in Christ. We got to put a stop to this. And they probably got the others a little amped up over it uh, and uh, made the problem worse. So this could have been disastrous for the church, right? But look at how the leadership helps the people stay on point and stay focused. Uh, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, okay, it's a warm greeting from the get-go. You know, he knows that there are some there with bad motives, but Peter also knows Peter isn't perfect. Uh, and so, you know, we're addressing each other as fellow sinners saved by grace. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. You know, starting with Peter and the, uh, the whole business of Cornelius coming to Christian faith, you know, that was a good 10 years ago already. Some time ago God made that choice. It's been a decade already. So we're going to keep moving from point A and get you to point B where you can see clearly what the implications of this are. And it is God who made that choice. So whose side do you want to be on? Verse 8, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. And that was evidenced by the work of the Holy Spirit among them. Okay, brothers, you've all seen that. God made that choice. God did it. God knows the heart. 
and God's accepting them, and He showed that by giving them the Holy Spirit. You can see what's going to happen here. It kind of begs the question, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples, the Gentiles, a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? Have we followed the law perfectly? We couldn't do that. It never gave us certainty of salvation. Why do you want to put that on them? God chose them already. God showed that He chose them by what He did and how the Spirit was at work. Why do you want to put that yoke on them? So you see, it can never be Jesus and something that saves you. And again, it's still a very slippery slope. Well, yeah, Jesus died and paid for your sins on the cross, but you've got to choose to follow Him. One of the reasons I am a Lutheran Christian is that I can say this theology. If I end up in heaven, it is only totally and completely because of God's grace and the Holy Spirit's work in me through the gospel. If I end up in hell, it is only totally and completely my own fault. Now, those sound like two contradictory th statements, but they're not. You know, the, the faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit as He's at work through the Word in whatever form the Word is presented, through another person, through Scripture, through whatever form. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit's the one who gets all the glory for creating and sustaining faith in us and renewing our hearts and minds day by day. All I can do is put up roadblocks. And for me, I go back to things like Romans chapter 1 again on that, where I've been referring to it already today, where God says that no one has an excuse. Everyone is without excuse because they can look at the world around them and see that someone put it together. And God promises that if someone seeks Him, He will find them. So the only thing I can really do as a human being then is not bother seeking Him or deliberately choose not to. And that's where a lot of people land, isn't it? Um, so the point here is that it can never be Jesus and. It's only Jesus. And they were trying to add something to it. Some of them with good intentions again, you know, they, they maybe were genuinely concerned that these are God's commands and these people need to follow them to honor God, missing the point that those commands had been fulfilled in Christ. They were being moved from point A, Old Testament, to point B, New Testament, and this is part of the process of moving them. Um, what's the reaction? Verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Something was going on there. Paul is right. Yes, God has accepted these people. And you can see the realization beginning to dawn. And, and that's how it happens sometimes, right? You, you look back and say, well, why didn't I get that before? Well, because you're human, uh, like me. And, and sometimes it takes time for realizations to dawn, um, the Holy Spirit to get through. Verse 13, when they finished, James half-brother of our Lord, a leader in the Jerusalem church, spokesman for the assembly now. James spoke up, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. All the evidence that God accepted them, the Holy Spirit was at work there, all of it. He's made that clear. And then James basically goes on to say, you know what, guys, this shouldn't have surprised us because the prophets all talk about it. And that's where he goes next. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, with exactly what, P, uh, 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 sorry, uh, what uh, is being described for us here about God working through the Gentiles, as it is written. And then he quotes, uh, this time what, from the book of uh, Amos. Is it Amos? Do I have the right reference there? Yes, it is. Okay. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. Okay, so if it's rebuilding David's fallen tent, it sounds like he's talking about the Jewish people, right? So I'm going to rebuild the Jewish church in the New Testament sense of it. I'm going to bring the gospel to them. That was step one. But then, inspired by God, Amos went on. There's a purpose behind restoring it to the Jewish church, restoring the gospel and restoring them. 
in order that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. The purpose of bringing the gospel to the synagogues, to the Jewish church, to the proselytes who knew about the Old Testament was so that the gospel could be brought to the Gentiles who knew nothing about it. Those people who thought that Paul and Barnabas were Zeus and Hermes. The gospel had to be brought to them as well. Okay, and that was the very purpose of bringing it to the Jews first. Amos said that a long time ago. There's another example of how it was always intended for the Gentiles. Uh, and I, I love the quote that, uh, that James chose here uh, that ends with that, you know, all this has been known for ages anyway. So why is it taking us so long to get on board is the implication. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should make it, or sorry, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. You know, not stand in God's way. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. All right, this is really a fascinating response and a Christ-centered response. Uh, the reason that they're going to make the request, and I'll go into the things that he talks about in a second, but the reason he's going to make that request is verse uh, 2. That's not 2, that's uh, 21. For Moses has been preached all over. So people are aware of those laws, in other words. People know that they exist. So then if you, Gentile believers, uh, let's see, um, eat food that has been offered to idols, that could harm the faith of your Jewish fellow believers. And you wouldn't be able to sit down and eat with them. They might not do that. Uh, from sexual immorality, you know, there were relationships allowed in the Gentile world and culture that they didn't really think were wrong, but it was in opposition to Jewish culture. So that would create division in the church again. <clears throat> and from the meat of strangled animals and from blood, other things that were unclean and forbidden in the Jewish heart. And so what's really happening here? The, the advice is to deal with areas that will be areas of weakness for the Jews. Now, imagine this for a second. The Jewish leader is saying, you know what? For me and my people, maybe not for James so much who's speaking, but for some of my people, this is an area of weakness and we need to learn to deal with it. But for now, Gentile believers, we're not demanding anything, but please, because of our weakness as Jewish background people, would you do us the honor of refraining from these three items so that we can deal with our weaknesses? That is a humbling statement from the leader of the Jerusalem church. Do you see what I mean? He's, he's basically saying it's because of our weakness that we're asking you this favor. Please, for our sake, would you do this? And none of it's a demand. It's just advice. So he is humbly, essentially, the Jews are described as the weaker brother here. He's humbly asking them to do the Jewish believers a, fail, a favor. That is putting your pride on the line, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, they keep hearing Moses. It's read everywhere on every Sabbath. And, you know, it's going to take some time for us to process this. We're moving from point A to point B. We're not there yet. <clears throat> Verse 22, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So there's going to be a, a people accompanying them to show them this is really true. None of this is made up. And again, they are sent. They chose Judas, called Barsabas, and Silas. So we were reintroduced to Silas again. Uh, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, were part of the family, accepted from the get-go. To the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us, important, without our authorization. This was not us and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. That sentence makes me smile, but I get it. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. All they're really saying, though, is we utterly and completely submit to what the Holy Spirit says, okay? Not putting themselves on level footing. Uh, so here's the requirements, just what was listed. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. You know, so nowhere is the law laid down. You'll, you'll do well to avoid these things. And by sending the, the people from the Jerusalem church along, they could fill out what was meant behind this. You know, it's kind of like these days sending an email. You never get the tone of what the person really meant. It's better to talk in person or on the phone or whatever. So they sent people who could talk in person and give the tone of what was behind this. Please, because of our weakness, would you do this? Uh, the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, uh, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. So what we've got here is an example of the law being used in a good sense. You know, these are things that will help all of us be unified. Uh, so please, for, for that sake, the sake of unity, please adhere to what we're suggesting. Not law in the bad sense. You better be circumcised and follow all the law of Moses or you're not going to heaven. That's not correct. The purpose of the law is to show us our sin so that the gospel can show us our Savior. To show us our sickness so that God's uh, uh, answer to that sickness can be revealed to us in meaningful ways. Uh, that's what the, the, uh, the church council in Jerusalem is trying to do here, not set up stumbling blocks. Uh, 31, the people read the letter and were glad for its encouraging message. So they took it in a positive way. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. Again, prophets, that's to take God's word and apply it to a situation. So they were able to expand upon what was meant by the letter and expand upon the freedom they have in Christ. Uh, after spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they taught, uh, or sorry, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. And that went on for some time. So we've come to the end of the first missionary journey a while ago. Then there's the council at Jerusalem. And now, just at the end of chapter 15, we move into the second missionary journey. So we need a new map. There it is up there. Uh, it's going to be longer and more complex. The first one was about a year long. The second one was long. Uh, and the third one was about two years long. So the second one that's just beginning here was the longest of them. And again, there are good things happening, so you know Satan's going to rear his head. Uh, just the last few verses here. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So back along the route of the first journey again. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. So there was a rift in the relationship. Uh, the good news is that relationship was later restored as Paul's epistles show he had great honor and respect for both Barnabas and for John Mark. Uh, and John Mark, again, is the author of the Gospel of Mark. But right now, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. So, okay. Was it right? They're sinners too. But they parted company to cool down and the outcome later that they were reconciled and restored and had great honor and respect for each other shows that they practiced forgiveness. You know, so it's just human nature. Uh, and uh, what ends up happening then is uh, Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. So you can see that on the map. That's the dotted line with the number one next to it. And uh, Paul chose Silas and left commended, again entrusted, sent by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went north through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Sort of going back to the area where Tarsus was, his home base, uh, and working there. And you can see from there it's going to go further into what we think of as modern-day Turkey uh, and uh, across the Aegean eventually into what we think of as Greece and back again to Ephesus. It'll take a long time. But the beginnings of the second journey are here. So what do we cover today? There's always pushback. Satan tries to disrupt 
anything connected to the success of the gospel. Here we saw over and over, though, that people made good choices. When those things happened, they went to the Lord in prayer. They went to the apostles to get their advice. They listened to each other. They didn't lash out. They humbled themselves instead of being prideful uh, and asked of others uh, when they had needs and asked for understanding, and they worked for unity under the gospel. And even when there were you know, disagreements like Paul and Barnabas had, okay, they made a parted ways for a while, but they didn't do so with animosity. Uh, they worked on forgiveness, and they continued to work together through the mission of the church. Okay, so that's probably where we'll stop for today. We're coming up on 2 o'clock. Uh, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. That whole section to me say, sounds like a, a really big compromise. A really big? Compromise. Compromise. Um, which, which section? To Moses and one of them wanted to make sure that they were circumcised yeah. and all these other things. So they softened the rules a little bit. You know, immorality, don't eat meat that was with blood in it. You know. Yeah, I can, I can see what you're saying, but let's keep fixed on what the main complaint was. They wanted the Gentiles to follow all of the Old Testament law. And that, those, the purpose of those laws had been fulfilled. So they couldn't ask them to do that. So it was, I guess, a sense, a compromise because they had to take what was important from their cultural background and be ready to give it up. But it was time to give it up. Uh, and, uh, you know, how long ago? 100 years ago. More than that, probably, I don't know, 150 years ago uh, in North America, uh, there were white churches and there were black churches. Was that right? No. And it, it was hard for people to, to make that leap, right? They had to leave behind the language of their heart that they'd grown up with and learn something new. So I wouldn't use the word compromise, I'd use the word course correction. And I think the, the Old Testament, the Jewish Christians, needed a course correction. Uh, and the course correction demanded that they make changes in their life. And that was hard for them. And in a sense, a compromise, but a compromise in the right direction for the truth. And they humbly asked for understanding as they did so. To me, that's the biggest part of it. They had to sacrifice pride in order to do that. Okay, we need to make a change. That's going to be hard. Would you help us through it? And that's a hard thing for most of us to ask of others, isn't it? Yeah. Any other thoughts? Good comment. Well, this is actually going to be our last gathering before Christmas. We'll pick up again in the new year. Uh, so for those watching online, I'll emphasize that on the website as well. Uh, and we'll close there with prayer for today. Lord, we thank you for your patience with us. That is unswerving uns uh, and unwavering. And it is so dearly needed. We thank you that in your mercy, you continue to be at work in our hearts and lives. So we pray that we would allow you opportunity to do that and remain open to your work. At times, it will demand that we sacrifice things that uh, are so important to us uh, and change and move in different directions. Help us to do that if it means adhering to the truth of the gospel. And when that is the case, give us the strength to do so, even sacrificing pride if we need to for the sake of being your people in Christ. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
else invites me to call him father The Christmas story is, is more than a nice myth. It's more than a, a sentimental time to be with family. It's more than a, than a quaint manger scene you put somewhere in your house. God came because our lives were shrouded in darkness. And that darkness can only be dispelled by His presence. We're going to spend four sessions talking about names that God gave to Jesus through the prophet Isaiah some 800 years before Jesus came. These names encapsulate the essence of who Jesus is. They carry deep meaning that speak to the darkest and most broken parts of our hearts. Do you know Jesus as Emmanuel? Do you know him as wonderful counselor, as everlasting father, your redeemer, your restorer, your righteousness, your hope of heaven? You see, Jesus is all of these things in his very nature, but he won't be them to you until you believe on his name. This season is a bright sign pointing you to Jesus. Unto you, a child is born. Unto you, a son has been given. Will you receive him? Will you believe on his name? Oh, my Lord. 